Welcome, my friends, to How Women Inspire. Today, you are in for a treat. We're speaking with my friend, Marsha Daywood. The impact she has in the world is so significant, you almost don't even know where to begin. But I'm going to give you sort of some highlights. And I also want you to lean in because we have a really great opportunity. She's got a book coming out in two weeks from today when I'm recording this. Marsha is the author of Do Good While Doing Well. I just want you to think about that. Do Good While Doing Well. What do you think that means? I want you to just think about that as I introduce you to her. She's a TEDx speaker. She hosts her own podcast. She is an investor in early stage companies and startups and venture firms. She actually serves on the Securities and Exchange Commission's Small Business Capital Formation Advisory Committee. I just want to say we are so lucky to have her and her voice in that role. She is a venture partner with MindShift Capital. She's also the chair emeritus with longtime amazing distinguished service at the Angel Capital Association, which is a global professional society for angel investors. She's also an associate producer on the award-winning documentary, Show Her the Money. Marsha, I am so happy to be able to have this time with you today. Thank you for coming. And boy, are we lucky to hear from you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I love talking to you, Julie. Well, one of the things that everybody hears me say with some frequency is in middle essence, having an impact and doing it with other women is actually a developmental life stage necessity. And I feel like that's exactly what we're talking about with this book. So I'm really excited to dive in. But before we get into all the, the juicy bits and technical stuff, let's have a little bit of fun. Do you have a walk on song or a song you play on the days when you need a little lift or, or when you want to celebrate? Yes, absolutely. And that would be unstoppable. Because oh, that's yeah. what we as women have to be. And sometimes when you have those days and you're thinking to yourself, geez, I'm doing all this stuff and like, what's going to happen? And like, is it going to really make a difference? Does anybody care? And you just like, you play that song and you're like, yes, we're all unstoppable. Exactly. I love that. And by the way, everybody who's listening to this, we actually have a Spotify playlist and this will be included in that playlist. So if you need your inspiration playlist, look up the How Women Lead Spotify playlist. Let's dive in. I have so many questions about this new book and the time's going to fly. Maybe just explain, do good while doing well. We can all guess what that means, but can you give the highlight of what that means to you? Sure. Well, I've been investing in early stage companies for over 12 years now. And I realized that this is a way that you can give back. You can invest in companies that are making impact in the world. They're doing good. They're making incredible innovations. You can back female founders who don't get very much of the funding, which I know I know we're going to get into. And you can really make a difference. But you can also potentially get a financial reward as well because this asset class, while you do need to diversify your portfolio and invest in several companies, and we can talk a lot about the ways you can do that, you can potentially get financial returns as well. So you're doing good by investing in the companies that are making real change with the potential for financial reward. I always think about is values aligned investing too, right? Can I invest along the lines of things that are important to me? For those of you listening, if you haven't looked at your portfolio, and I'm just going to say, I have a little shame around this, but I'm going to forgive myself. Someone told me to look at my, port, my, my, you know, the stocks I was investing in. And I had, you know, you just put money in and you ignore it. You think you hope it's doing well, you know, or you look every once in a while. And they said to look, and I realized I was investing in stuff that are so against my values that I almost had a heart attack. So take a take a deep breath if you need to drink a cocktail or just like go get some sun or get some exercise first, drink some, eat some chocolate, and then look under the hood. It's important to do. So is this for everyday people? Like how can everyday people contribute to this positive social impact through investing? And how does that differ from charity? Yeah, well, back in the day, people would think, well, I can't, I can't invest in a private company because that's just for the rich and well-connected. But things have changed a lot in the last, especially eight years, because the Securities and Exchange Commission changed the rules. And now anyone can invest in an early stage company for as little as $50 through equity crowdfunding. Now, you do have to have an internet connection and you do have to have either a bank account or a credit card. But those are the really the main requirements for anybody 
everybody to get involved. (laughs) Right. And there's so many companies out there that are doing these incredible things. And sometimes that bringing the crowd together and that rallying of the crowd not only helps to raise capital so that the company can you know, keep going and grow, but also so that they have more customers, they get their message out, they have actually kind of built in marketing with it. Yeah, it's kind of driving the energy. And then you have a couple hundred people who invest in your crowdfunding, all trying to make sure your company is successful and telling everybody about your product. So that's a pretty good win. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you, in that scenario, are you owning a portion of the company or how does that work in crowdfunding? Usually, so there's a bunch of different types of crowdfunding, and I go into this all in the book. Most people are familiar with rewards-based crowdfunding, like Kickstarter or Indiegogo, where you get something, but you don't necessarily have any ownership in the company. But nowadays, with these changes with the SEC, you can actually have a small piece of ownership in the company when you are part of an equity crowdfunding campaign. There's also something called debt crowdfunding, which I think is also very interesting, and that is more for small businesses that are more Main Street businesses. So if you have a coffee shop or a dry cleaner, that can also be a way that you can get your local community to help you if you need to raise some funding in order to, you know, kind of get over the the dry seasons or something like that. So there's a lot nowadays that people can do, not just for startups, but for all small businesses across the U.S. That's amazing. Do you have any of those platforms that you think are the sort of cream of the crop that we should be paying attention to? I, of course, have my preferences, <laughs> so <laughs> I will share. But I do sit on the SEC, Small Business Capital Formation Advisory Committee, it's a mouthful, like you mentioned, with a person named George Cook, who happens to be the CEO of Honeycomb Credit, which is a debt crowdfunding platform, and I love what they're doing. Of course, they are based in in Pittsburgh, which my heart still lives in Pittsburgh, even though I don't anymore, and they have a great platform for that. The three companies that are really the leaders in equity crowdfunding are WeFunder, Start Engine, and then my personal favorite is Republic.com. And they have a lot of different ways that you can search. I kind of like their interface, but all three of them have a lot of things that they can offer people. So I'm a venture investor. And one of our seed stage companies, but a pretty significant sized company, did a crowdfunding process. And the the crowdfunding company put in like $1.5 million. So they did their diligence. They put in a lot of money. That was sort of reinforcement to everybody who was looking at it that like, no, somebody really did diligence. This isn't just a platform and only a platform. It actually gave a lot of confidence to people and, and even made people who maybe the founder didn't reach out to want to get involved. This is a r- early days, you know, when Very, people tried yeah. crowdfunding, it was like, it was all your blood, sweat and tears and your people and your friends. It was just a way to get your friends to see something formal outside of a transaction just with you. But I think it's changed and evolved a lot thanks to your leadership at the SEC and, and some of the other creative innovators in this space. Yeah. I do totally agree with that. It is very early days. But one of the things I really like about the crowdfunding platforms in general is the transparency. So even as a private investor in a company through the traditional venture ways, either you're an angel investor and you would invest directly in a company or through a fund or something like that. I don't know who who the other investors are. I might know what I know about the company, but do I know what the other investors know about the company? What kind of diligence was done on this? Yeah. I don't really maybe have all those insights, but on a crowdfunding platform, all of those things have to be disclosed. That's part of the SEC rules. So no conversations can happen off of the platform, which I really like because then I can see what maybe Katie was asking or Kelly or something like that so that I can see, well, wait, oh, I do have that question too. Or, oh, I didn't think about that. And now all of that conversation and all of that transparency is there. It's real democratization, right? Yes. So. Okay, women traditionally have been tapped with doing the philanthropic giving. And so I think for some women, a lot of people will say to me, well, women are more likely to give a donation of $10,000 than they are to write a $10,000 investment check in a venture fund or direct investing. Can you talk a little bit about that feeling? What are you seeing? And what are some vehicles that might be created now beyond crowdfunding that people can use to think about the transition from only being philanthropic maybe? Absolutely. And, you know, I'm a huge fan of donating money to charities. Uh, Our charities need that money. But the average amount of funding that goes to charities per year is about $475 billion, which is a lot of money. 
However, that is only equivalent to about 1% of the value of the U.S. stock market. So if we think that we're going to get these nonprofits and we're going to put the burden all on them with this very small percentage of money compared to all of the for-profit companies out there, that's unfair. It's an unfair burden to put on charities. So how else can we do this? How can we, A, get more money to charities, but how can we also get these philanthropic dollars put to use for for-profit companies and for these innovations that we care about, and especially getting them to female founders? Well, there are ways that you can use philanthropic dollars, I go into it in the book, in order to invest in a for-profit company. But what I love about this is it's like a triple win because you can make a donation and immediately get your tax deduction just like you would to any normal 501c3. However, then in the meantime, you can direct those funds to a for-profit company, preferably women-led, of course, to be able to do <laughs> something good and to help with their innovation. And then let's say that that company has an exit and now there is three times the amount of money that you originally donated, you can now direct that back to another 501c3. So you as the donor would never get the money back, but you could use your dollars, because that's what happens in all donor advised funds, like a Fidelity, they'll just take the money okay. and they'll put it into the stock market and they'll make money with it until you decide what charity you want to give it to. It's the exact same thing. Here, you're going to donate the money and then invest it and then be able to have more, hopefully, that you can donate later. So I did my first donor advised fund and I just put $5,000 in at Schwab. It was pretty super easy. And I got, had a little extra money one year and and that's how I began. And I want to do something special with my kids. So if you don't have a donor advised fund yet and you're listening to this, you know, if you donate to charity and you want to be able to donate more and you might need a tax write off this year, or you'd like to be able to sort of think about how to, can you use this as a vehicle to do investing, it's a great way to get started. And there's a new organization that's being formed right now called Catacap. Are you familiar with it, Marsha? I am. Um, so it's brand new, but it's out of a really sustained, mature organization called Impact Assets. And I think you can put as little as 50 or $250 into a group, almost like crowdfunding, but it's called a special purpose vehicle. So you can actually put money into this and you can pick different companies and funds to invest in. But I think yes. it's awesome. So there's that. There are self-directed donor advised funds. Like you mentioned, yeah. Schwab wouldn't be a self-directed, but you could use one like Impact Assets. But the other thing that I recently learned about is Inspire Access, which is a 501c3 charity. They take donations and then they direct those donations to underrepresented founders, women, people of color, LGBTQ, founders who are doing amazing things. And that whole process is basically everything we just talked about, minus the fact that you don't have to have a donor advised fund. I'm not asking for permission anymore. I'm not asking for a seat at the table. My friends, this is the first generation of us. We have a huge opportunity. We have power and influence and wealth. And we can start building the tables where we get the prime seats. Today, we want to invite you to join us as investors in venture. I know no one's asked you to do it before. It might be something that seems scary or foreign, but I promise you it's not that different than investing in a mutual fund where your retirement funds are. I want you to lean in and just learn a little bit more. How about making the commitment that in the next 12 months, you can give yourself 12 months to figure it out and to take a step. I wanna invite you to be part of the new table of power and influence and wealth. You're invited. I want to sit at the table with you because we're gonna make big change. We're gonna make the world we've been dreaming of. Yeah. Awesome. There's so many options for people oh, today. That's so many really options. Neat. And, and we, we can't forget to mention Daintree Capital, Alicia Griffey. Yeah. She's amazing and she's doing incredible things there. So, and she's, she does a lot with donor advised funds too. So this book, does it cover all of that? All of it. Okay, good. Is it a, is it like a, a how to, is it really giving you the full, full frame of the industry? Cause I know so many people ask me, like, I want, I want the definitive source. Is this yes. definitive? 
Go this ahead. is, yeah, this is a why to book. So if you want to learn about term sheets or due diligence or how you do all that kind of stuff, you need to go get a book on angel investing itself, or you need to go to the Angel Capital Association and take the classes. But if you have no idea what an the term angel investing is, you don't know how you would ever, how you as one person could ever make a difference. That's what this book is for. It's to demystify all of the things that when we talk about angel investing, I talk to so many people and they would say, oh, that's so interesting. You you get to uh, interact with these entrepreneurs. They're amazing. You get to see all this innovation. And I'd be like, yes, you can do this too. Me? I Oh, no, I, I couldn't do that. I don't know. I've only worked that. in tech for 30 years no, and old and products and, you know, med schemes and, you know. Uh, yes. And these are very smart people who have yeah. so much to offer these entrepreneurs and they think, oh, no, I can't do that. I'm trying to like lift the veil. Let's like just see what's under the hood and yeah. know a little bit more about the asset class. And then you can figure out how you can get involved. Are there initiatives or strategies out there that you can implement to get more people understanding what's available and getting involved in connecting to women entrepreneurs? What are you seeing there as the movements that are the most inspiring to you? Yeah, well, I mean, Catherine Gray has done an amazing job with the show Her the Money Movie Mint, as she calls it. I love that term. And just bringing awareness. I think that is the biggest problem. You know, we do have a huge awareness problem, not just for female founders. That's obviously very a small amount of funding. Less than 3% of venture capital goes to females. But we have an awareness problem overall with the entrepreneurial ecosystem because there are entrepreneurs in every city and every town doing some really innovative and amazing things. And I know I was totally fascinated 12 years ago when I went to my first angel investing meeting and thought, where have I been? I, yeah. I think I've been living under a rock. I had no idea. Well, the first time someone asked me to do an angel investment, they said, are you an accredited investor? And I was like, oh my God, do I have to fill out forms? Do I have to like, you know, go you know, spend hours getting all my bank statements and stuff? And then they were like, no, you just have to attest you make enough money. So to be an accredited investor, which is different than the crowdfunding that you said has been democratized. But to be an angel investor or a venture investor, you generally have to be an accredited investor. You just have to have make $200,000 a year or have three hundred dollars in income as a family or outside of your home. Like in your retirement, you need to have a million dollars in your retirement. They just want to, the SEC, well, you can speak to the SEC what they want, <laughs> but you, they want to make sure that people can afford to That's lock right. their money down for a while because in a venture fund, it's 10 years. So women today have a lot of wealth, right? That's why this book is so important and we need to activate women. So I, the last study I saw said 52% of the wealth today, and there's a massive wealth transfer happening. But women entrepreneurs are getting very little funding. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and there's several reasons. And I think the number one reason is because we just don't have enough other women making the investment decisions. So we need more women to get in the game. They need to be sitting at the table, making the decisions about where the money is being deployed. That's one. Two, there are biases. We all have them, women, men, we all have biases. We need to start to at least acknowledge those biases. And as female founders, we need to understand that those biases exist and know about ways that we can counteract them. I do talk about that in the book. The other thing is sometimes women are looked at as having lifestyle businesses, which is not necessarily always the case. A lot of times they're growing amazing, scalable businesses, big yeah. businesses, great startups that are going to scale and go really big. But sometimes people will say, well, are you just doing this until you can have a baby? And that is just the wrong way to look at it. Yes, Marion from Archer Roos says that in the Show Her the Money movie. And I was just like floored when I heard that. And then the other thing is the networking. So I tell the story about how my husband's a huge golfer and he goes golfing all the time. And I still don't understand why it can't be the same amount of time as a yoga class. I just, I don't get it. Anyway, finally, one day I was like, you know, I'm really not annoyed that you play golf. I'm annoyed that you get access to people I don't get access to. And that was like the light bulb moment. And I thought, you know, as women, we just don't have those same types of networks. But I think that's changing. And we are getting more people into the right kind of networks, kind of like how women lead, how women invest, how women inspire. Those are the types of networks that I know I want to be a part of because that's going to get me connected and be able to meet other people like-minded like me. So I basically say now that my golf course is angel investing. 
I love that. I love that. I don't want to be on the golf course all those hours. I don't either. Um, no. You know, so and then a brunch and a Zoom call with a thousand women who are kick ass. I think that sounds like a perfect day to me. Um, uh, so can we just talk real quick about as somebody who wants to invest, start to play in this landscape, right? To do good and do well at the same time. What is the decision tree like and who is it right for? So how much time do you have to have and put in or how much exposure can you get if you do have the time? So I think it varies for everyone. And I I kind of go through that in the book. I, I basically list out for people, okay, if you don't have a lot of time or you do have a lot of time, here are your options. If you don't have a lot of money or you do have a lot of money, here are your options. But keep in mind that entrepreneurs, they need a lot more than just money. They need expertise, networks. They need connections. They love it when an investor gets involved and helps them by saying, what is it that I can do for you? What kind of doors can I open for you? Those things are just so important. And if we can get more people to get involved like that, I think at least to start, sometimes I'm like, hey, you can dip your toe in the water. If you're thinking, oh, you know, financially, this isn't for me, you can still get involved with helping these companies. They need a lot more than money. They need help with even cheerleading. Cheerleading is a great thing. You know, just being there at growing a company is hard. So being able to be there and help people along the way, help with social media and just by liking their posts, by reposting, all of those types of things, they all help these entrepreneurs to be able to grow their companies. Well, you just defined our credo. So be fierce advocates for them, back them up even when they're not in the room, reinforce her voice, like promote her social media, say yes to making introductions. And then I would just say also be unabashedly visible yourself. In some ways, that also means be a megaphone to make sure other women know about this. Now that you've heard this podcast, to me, I'm going to buy this book and give it to my kids. I'm going to give it to a whole bunch of people because they're all, people are desperately asking me how to get started. They feel like it's complicated. And what I love about you, Marsha, is you've done every bit of it. You've done it all. You've done venture investing, angel investing, crowdfunding. You're on the SEC's committee. No one better in this country can really help people understand the landscape and then figure out the right spot for them. So I'm just so grateful for your leadership in our country. And I just admire you so much. If I was going to, sh- I mean, let's just ask by decade, if I'm going to share this with a 25 year old, what would our hope be for that 25 year old? Oh, absolutely. This is who I hope will read the book. I hope that they would get started even in the smallest way, because I know if I had known about this when I was 25, the things I could have done, you know, yeah. and I was, yeah. just, I, it really energizes me to know. Yeah. I mean, so many people in that generation right now, they're super smart. They're well connected. They're always on, you know, devices, but they, but in a, it, it can be in a good way. And, you know, we can really help them to learn about all of the things that they can do and just knowing that and letting them decide this is up to you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you have lots of choices. You just need to understand and be educated enough to make the right decision for you. So they might start with crowdfunding, even if it's 25 bucks, right? Yeah, Something absolutely. not in. So you're 35, you're too busy because you're running up the ladder and maybe you have a family, but you've got a little more disposable income and your friends starting a company. What would you recommend to them? Right. Well, I've and I've talked to a lot of entrepreneurs who say, oh, I'm so excited that you wrote this book because I have people like that. My friends now want to come and invest in my company, but I have to spend hours kind of explaining to them what angel investing is. And they're kind of like, oh, this is a private company. Oh, you mean I can't that I can't see it on e-trade? You know, wait a minute. Oh, this doesn't make any sense to me, right? So that's what I'm hoping that entrepreneurs will actually be able to say to their friends, hey, you can read this. It'll help you understand. And then, yes, you can make an investment in my company and you'll have a better feel for what that's all about. So what about a 45 year old? They've they've run up the ladder. Maybe their kids are even going off to college or getting a little older. They've got some more disposable income and they might even be thinking about a career pivot. How does this how can this be interesting and beneficial for them? 
Yeah, well, that's like a little bit about how I got involved. You know, I was at that point where I was like, hey, I want something else that I can do that'll be interesting. And I have some disposable income that I could use. So how can I, you know, make a difference? But the one thing we didn't talk enough about yet is about this idea of diversification. So for somebody like that, I would say you need to start investing in funds. And really, everybody should be invested in multiple companies. And the best, fastest way to do that is to invest into a fund, either venture-backed fund or even there are ways that you can do that through angel groups. Now, a lot of angel groups have angel funds. And then also, of course, by diversifying a portfolio on an equity crowdfunding site. In fact, I did write a workbook that goes with the book that will be out around the same time as the book. And in there, I have people do a little exercise that's a mock portfolio. So you make a a portfolio of 10 companies on an equity crowdfunding site, and you can kind of get a taste for it with some play money before you ever use your real money. I think about venture investing is like a mutual fund product for the private markets. And yeah. single trade stock trades is more like angel investing, you know, to, like, to me, that's sort of equated in some ways. And so I'm I'm in my mid 50s. I have more disposable income, but maybe I'm, I'm, I'm starting to pay attention to. Well, certainly it's about my power and influence, but what I'm also sort of thinking about, OK, at what point do I need this money to work for me and be available during my retirement? What what kind of things should people be thinking about in their mid 50s even? Yeah, well, I think it goes along the same lines, you know, diversification pays getting into funds, you know, sometimes you'll have those earlier wins. So if you know, you're thinking, hey, I'd like to maybe not have this money tied up forever. But I also think somebody who has more business experience, they can offer so much to an early stage company, and they don't even realize the type of value that they're bringing. So I think Yeah, Yeah. I think that's always super important. And always keep in mind that you don't want to invest money that you can't afford to not have access to for a while, right? So at the Angel Capital Association, we always say don't invest more than 5 to 10% of your investable assets. You don't want to put your kid's college fund into angel investing or venture capital. It would probably not be the greatest idea, especially if they're in high school. So. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Marsha. I feel like we could, you got to read the book and I, I want you to give it to the 25 year old, the 35 year old, the 45 year old, and then 55 year old. I feel like if we don't get women investing and setting the stage for the culture and the types of companies and the types of jobs that we want in the future, we're going to continue to have to have band-aids. So the pay equity issues, they don't happen when you have 50% of the companies being founded by women. It behooves all of us to get in the game saw and to do good and change the future for our kids if you're at my age. And I just want to say thank you for everything you've done. I know that so much of it is just out of the goodness of your heart. You're a tremendous leader and such an inspiration. I can't wait to get the workbook myself. Thank you, Marcia. How can people find you and how can they find the book? Everything is on my website, marshadawood.com. And you can get everything there, the book, the workbook, all kinds of stuff. Amazon, all those fun places, bookshop.org. I'm a big fan of that place. So, Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And for everybody who's listening, tell 10 friends. That's my recommendation and my request of you. That's a gift to them. And it's a gift to the movement for all of us. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Keep inspiring.